Wow. The declaration of the church of Jesus in the darkest days of earth is that we declare together the gospel. Go, why as the world events unfold as they do, thank you so much, Adam. As the as world events unfold as they do, why are we still here in the last days? And the reason is you are here to be light in darkness, and the darkness is great. Satanic attacks are great, but the light of Jesus is greater, and you are here to be the light in the world. Uh, look down, James chapter uh, four and five. Let me show you. So you ever been, ever been blessed, just unexpectedly blessed? You were unexpectedly blessed by a gift. You're like, wow, that's an awesome gift. You were unexpectedly blessed by somebody paying you a compliment. You didn't expect it. It just came and you, you, were, you were, somebody maybe just started praying for you. But let me ask you this. You ever been blessed by chastisement? Uh, somebody came, they pulled you aside, they said a couple things to you, and at first you were like, I'm going to kill you. And then as you thought it over, you thought, actually, they might be right. And then your wife said they are. And so that kind of destroyed. Um, I, my first job was at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, I had, the, there were two groups at the Hollywood Bowl that worked there. Uh, there was the young people, which by the way, I was part of back then, college students struggling through, just taking tickets, doing whatever they told us to do. Uh, another group of people that worked there that were the old people, uh, they worked there because they got a free show every night. They got to go to the Hollywood Bowl. We were oblivious to the culture we were immersed in. Uh, oblivious that like, like they, they had John Williams there doing all of his music. And we, we were just like, home much longer is work because we were dumb. Uh, taking tickets one day, and as a couple comes through, they were excited and happy. I was talking to them. They, uh, as they left, I was shouting some stuff after them, and they were excited. I was, I was happy. My boss came by, leaned in, and I can't quote exactly what he said in church, but uh, what it amounted to this, the guests of the Hollywood Bowl don't really appreciate the ushers at the Hollywood Bowl shouting after them. And uh, at first I thought, hey, you didn't really understand the con, but you know what? That kind of blessed me actually my whole life. Uh, that just, ble- that, that it was this, remember where you are, remember who you are, what James is about to do. It, you ever been blessed by a talking to? James will pull you aside and have a talking to, to the people of Jesus. And here's, and, and if you'll let him, it's gonna bless you. But he speaks like an Old Testament prophet. Uh, it is probably some of the most striking passages in all of your Bible. What he is going to say is we just kind of naturally stray into the thinking that that which I have belongs to me. And he's gonna rise up and he's gonna shout through scripture and say, no, what you have does not belong to you. So we're like, hey, it's my job, my stuff, my body, my, my choice. It's all about me, my life. And James is gonna say, no, it's not your life. It's not your stuff. It's not for your glory. It's really all about God. Look down there, James chapter four, verse 13. Look at this. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we're going to go. And he says, we're going to go to such and such a town. We're going to spend, you know, we're just going to go. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to trade. We're going to make a profit. Look down there, verse 14. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Look, the first thing he says to us is, you you got to understand, you can make plans, but the future does not belong to you. Am I right? You do not own tomorrow. The future does not belong. The, the, the future belongs to someone. That someone is not you. Then look down there at verse 14. He's going to go on. He's, at least says, what's your life? What, my, my life? My life is everything, James. What's your life? Well, he says, you're a vapor. And what does this vapor do? He says, it appears. And then it what? Be encouraged. <laughs> it just vanishes. It says, he says, look, not, not only does the future not belong to you, your life doesn't belong to you. Um, this is very contradictory to our culture. And, and we can stand back and go, that's right. Very contradictory to America. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That's contradictory to me. Because I kind of assumed from, I don't know, the day I was born, I was kind of told and communicated to that I was very important. Life spends a lot of time beating out of you the feeling that you're very, you were, you were, you were born thinking you were important. Did you guys have grandparents? Got a grandma? Any of you the first grandchild? Listen, if you were the first grandchild, they just lavished love. I was the first grandchild, and I want you to know I was really important. In fact, I kind of, with all the grandchildren, I kind of just grew up knowing I was the most important. Um, that, that somehow, that extra love had just been, been spent my way. James says this, look, you're here, and then you're gone. What does he say? You appear, 
You didn't plan you. You just showed up. God planned you. And then he says it vanishes. You don't even choose when you're going to go. You show up and you go based on the time you've got. Look at verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, this is how life should be, he says. If the Lord lives, it will do, we'll, we'll, we'll live, we'll do this, we'll do that. Someone other than me is directing my life. Look at verse 16. As it is, your boast is your, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. Boast and he says, it's evil. Then he says, look, I'm not pushing against our culture. He says, even right and wrong don't belong to you. It's not that you get to choose what's right and what's wrong. Look at verse 17. This is nobody's favorite verse. It says, if you know the good you ought to do, if the standard has been set by God and you know what it is, he, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, what does he do? He sins. What do we do? We just make up some other, well, I don't like that part. It says it doesn't matter. Uh, he says, you're just blessed to know the truth. You don't get to choose what the truth is. Now, some of you are already looking at that like, that and like I told you it was going to be hard and you're like, hey, you know, David, you are such a drama queen. N none of that was really that hard, right? That is not difficult. That did not offend any of it. Well, it's okay. I'm, we're, all, we're all okay, but he's still talking. Uh, look down there at chapter, uh, chapter five, verses one to six. Um, he's going to talk to the wealthy and to the rich and to those old and understand that the Christian church at that time is under persecution, not just by Imperial Rome, but the wealthy. The church are the poor working out in the fields. They're the poor that are being exploited by the rich. And so the outcry from the church is, what about these wealthy that seem to get away with wickedness? Well, James has an answer. Look down there at James chapter five, verse one. Come, come now. You who are rich, what does he say to them? Weep and howl. For your misery that is coming upon you. Once again, nobody's favorite verse, right? Anybody like, like I memorize that. I live by that. That's my, that's my, look, he says, not only is your life not belong to you and uh, the, the future does not belong to you. Right and wrong don't belong to you. He says, your wealth doesn't belong to you. Your gold doesn't belong to you. The stuff that you have, maybe it wasn't given to you just to make you happy. Maybe it was given to you for a higher purpose. Look at verse two, your riches have raw garments. What are your garments, he says? They're moth-eaten. Back then, people usually would just own one pair of clothes, uh, sometimes a few pairs, but you'd wear the same clothes all your life. You didn't run over to Walmart. You would just wear clothes uh, for a lot of your life. You just wore the same. Then he said, he looks at the rich and he goes, isn't it crazy? These people, they've got one, two, three sets of clothes and you've got so many clothes, you don't even have time to wear them before the moths get to them. They're just eating them up. Your gold and your silver have what? Corroded. You, you, you took it and you buried it and it just, you know, gold, gold will just corrode down to nothing. You ever get an old penny and it's just corroded? Uh, I don't know why pennies corrode fat, but it, anyway. Um, it says your, their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. In fact, he says, you hoarded wealth in the last days. What, everybody, every today, is this the last days? He says, you know, be careful. Uh, he says, look, God gave you resources to help other people. And suddenly he looks at the rich and says, what are you doing? You're just taking the wealth that God gave you and you buried it, you consumed it all, you piled it, you assumed that it was for you. I was so interested in that verse that here's what I did just because I'm messed up. I went and bought a commentary. I own lots of commentaries. I own shelves of commentaries. I went and bought a commentary from one, uh, one of those prosperity gospel preachers, um, non-gospel, but you know, health, wealth, prosperity, that kind of stuff. I went and because I was like, hey, if you are a wealthy TV preacher, lots of sparkle, lots of glitz, and uh, you come to a verse like that and you're writing a commentary, you're going to make money on the commentary. What do you say when you say your wealth has corroded? It will be evidence against you. It will burn your flesh like fire. What do you do when you get there? Well, here was the answer. So I'll save you the, the money I spent on the commentary. Here was the answer. The, 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 quickly, the, the preacher says, yes, it does say that, but it's talking to the, not to the righteous. In other words, here was kind of the, the argument. That is talking to unbelievers, but apparently the, the argument was Jesus' death on the cross makes it okay for us to go ahead and hoard. I would say this, there is no chance that Jesus' death on the cross gives us permission to live like the wicked. Am I right? They're, they're like, like, it doesn't matter how many lights are on you. It doesn't matter how glitzy things get. Uh, Jesus did not die on the cross so that you can hoard wealth. 
so you can keep stuff. That's not, um, hey, guys, th- that stuff, like you, you follow Jesus, you'll get rich. That's not Christianity. That's a sales pitch from, a, from, from, a, from an unauthorized salesman leaning on the blood of Jesus Christ and abusing it in vain. Um, the Savior, I said, said, take up your cross and follow me. If anybody would come after me, he's got to die to himself. Look at verse 3. You've hoarded wealth in the last. Behold, now he's talking to these people that own all this stuff. The laborers who mowed your fields, the, the Christians, you kept back by fraud are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You cheat people and they cry. It's the same language used in uh, Genesis, cha- uh, where, where, uh, is that chapter four, where God says to Cain, where's your brother Abel? He says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? He says, yeah, you know what? Your brother's blood cries out from the ground. Now James uses the same language and he says, the wages that you are supposed to give to the harvesters, you withheld and you cheated people so that you could keep money and it cries out against you. Verse five. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. What does he say? He says, look, final judgment, how you assess life does not depend on you, how we evaluate our lives. Um, You lived like there's no tomorrow. And he says, uh, he's saying to the wealth, he says, look, you lived like you would never give an account for your life, for the things that you did, for the things that you kept. And he said, it is as if the language there is striking. It's almost like you think, whoa, am I reading the Old Testament? No, you're reading the New Testament, brother of Jesus Christ. He says, you have fattened yourself for the day of slaughter. Or um, if I can put it this way, he says, isn't it kind of dumb to just assume that everything you have is so you can consume and consume and consume? What if all we're doing is fattening ourselves for the day of slaughter? In other words, it's like he says to us, some, of, some people never think, maybe I'll have to someday give an account for today, how I've behaved. People worry about an audit from the IRS. What about an audit from the GOD? Uh, verse six, you have condemned and murdered a righteous person. He doesn't resist you. That's talking about the church, the, the righteous. Um, I can't tell you something. One, is that slightly hard? Amen. You're like, no, I'm not going to say it. It is. I'm blessed by that. I'm, in fact, I am as blessed by that as I am the story of David and Goliath. I'm as blessed by it. You guys go around quoting Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And you, isn't it interesting how we kind of pick and choose which parts of the Bible we think are gonna bless us and we never pause and think maybe the hard stuff in the Bible all along was supposed to bless us. And so we're reading David and Goliath, which we read wrong anyway. We read David, I won't rant too long about this, but hold on. We read David and Goliath like, I am David. And then you read Daniel and the lions and you're like, I am Daniel. Let me tell you who we probably are. We are probably the little Israelites that are afraid when David showed up and needed somebody to rally them to fight the, the Philistines. Um, but anyway, we read all this stuff and we put it until we get to a passage like this and we're like, oh, whoa, unbelievers. That is to unbelievers. That has nothing to say to me. Why did this? I just started reading that and asking, what's God saying to us? What's God saying to me, to my church, to the people that I love? God, I don't know, about four, four things. Um, write this down. Here's blessing number one. And it's really simple. And it's this, look, you want to, look at that passage. There's the blessing of today. You see, you enjoy it. James says, look, your life is a vapor. You appear and you vanish. You do not hold the future. Um, Let me just say this to you, church. I hope you recognize that that which you have right now, you will not have forever. So the time that you spend a lot of your life waiting for the next season of life. One of these days, I'll be happy. I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I, just now, start building deep friendships. Go out to the national park. You're you're like, some of you are so busy complaining about 29 Palms, you've never been to a national park that's right there. Um, Enjoy your church. Enjoy the people in your church. Enjoy the fellowship in your church. Enjoy the music. Wasn't it good? Enjoy vacation Bible school. I hope if you've got little kids, spend a lot of time with your little kids and that time, hear me, that time is just a vapor. You spend a lot of time with kids waiting for the next season 
I just can't wait till they're potty trained. I just can't wait till they don't, they don't, right? Right? I hope if you've got kids, you spend some time rolling around on the floor. I hope you spend some time at Little League games and at some dances. Um, I hope you go to the park and, and I, I hope, I don't know, I hope, I hope you buy Legos and I hope every now and then you step on them and you, um, you married? You know, I, I hope you guys take a long wife and you turn the cell phone off. I hope that you hold hands and you sit in the car and you talk and eat donuts in the rain because life's a vapor. I hope that you laugh often. I hope when you get out in the desert, you can look up every now and then you can just be swept away by it all and you say, wow. Because James suddenly pauses and says, look, none of this ultimately belongs to us. It's a loan from God. And there's something about life that should sweep you away, but we spend so much of life focusing on wealth and gold and money. He says all that's going to corrode that we never look at eternal things. Hear me, your kids are eternal souls. Enjoy them. Your wife, guys, is an eternal soul. Enjoy her. Ladies, that amen? Um, that was the best point I got. So just, yeah. <laughs> to tell you how else that blesses me, there's the blessing there of perspective that we need to follow. He says, let me just give you some perspective. Look down there at verse 15. You make all kinds of plans. But he says, you don't know. You don't know what's coming. Instead of just saying, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the direction of my life. Here's my career. Here's how I'm going to live. He says, you ought to say, because you don't know the will. You do not sit on the throne of God. The angels do not ascend and descend upon you. You should say, if the Lord wills it, we'll do this or we'll do that. In other words, you're going to make some plans in life that are just going to fail because they weren't really the will of God. So the perspective is this. God is at work. All You'll be blessed by this as soon as you realize this. God's at work around you all the time and inviting you to join him constantly. It's what God's doing. Every situation you're in right now, God is already at work. In that, or if I can put it this way, God is on mission. He's on mission to carry the gospel. In Israel, God is on mission, but not only is God on mission in Israel, God's on mission in that marine base. God's on mission in 29 Palms. God's on mission all around you. And what he's doing, what was it? He went down the shore and he said to the disciples, come and I'll make you wealthy. No, he said, come, follow me and I will give your life meaning and perspective if you forsake everything. You talk about perspective and you follow me. The constant question of your life should be this. As you move through it, you get in a situation, just to ask God, what are you doing here? What are you doing in my marriage? What are you doing in this workplace? Usually what you're doing is you're praying, get me out, get me out, get me out, get me out. I cannot stand my boss. Maybe God's working in your boss and he put you there. You're like, this is the first moment I hated that sermon. Maybe, maybe God's at work in the very marriage you're trying to get out of. Maybe God's, am I right? And the perspective James has is you make all these plans, but you don't ask God, God, what is it you're doing? You're like, I'm doing nothing. God says, join me. Join me because I'm doing something all around. It's God invite, you know, usually when God invites you to join him in the church, in the workplace, and the, our answer to God is, God, I, these days I'm going to serve you. When I get old, when I retire, I'm going to serve you. But right now, I am exceedingly busy. Fill you in on something. No matter how busy you are, no matter how high your rank is, no matter what your day is filled with, when God calls you to do something, realize this, he's busier than you are. Amen. Because that's the number one excuse you all have. Hey, I can't serve the Lord right now. One of these days I'm gonna retire and it's just gonna be serve, serve, serve. No, it's not. It's gonna be go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. That's what it's gonna be. Hey, hear your pastor. Serve God while you're young. Serve God in your strength. Build up reward in heaven now. Um, remember Jacob running hard with all of his life and he lays down on the rock. And for him, life has all been a bit all about him. How can I get the blessing? How can I get the birthright? Me, me, me. And he lays down on a rock and he sees the heavens opened up. He sees God seated on angels coming and going. And the idea is this, that God sits enthroned above all of the earth and God is very busy and he's sending the angels out to carry out his bidding and he's bringing the angels here. And what God is saying to Jacob is, well, you think you're very busy. I'm very, very busy on the earth. And this life is not about you. This life is about me. Amen? Um, but look, it's not only the blessing of today, the blessing of perspective. There's the blessing he talks about gold. And he says, you use it. 
you use it, the blessing of gold. Um, James says, look, it is wrong to assume. It, in fact, it is sinful to assume that everything you have was given to you for yourself. I just got, I got, I got, you know? Now, some of you are already like, look, I don't need to be told about being generous because if I had money, I would be very generous. So God says, tell you what we'll do. We'll give you a little bit and see how you're doing with that. You're like, I got that. I got the little bit. Uh, gee, if you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with much. This is the part of the sermon where everybody gets real quiet. They're like, don't say nothing. He's going to talk about money. Yeah, and some of you are already trying to figure out, like, wait, when you say gold, you mean like bracelets? No, I mean like money. He gives us money. And um, our hearts have to be discipled out of greed or we fall into where the world is at. And pretty soon, even the church itself starts trying to make promises to you to pull you into the world. You follow Jesus, you're gonna be rich. You're gonna follow Jesus, you're gonna, am I right? And they tempt you with the very things that you have to be discipled out of that. Got a daughter, uh, by the way, this, when I tell you stories about my kids, I already got permission and beat up, okay? So, um, or bribed somebody or, anyway, a transaction already went down, but um, daughter, I'm not gonna tell you which one, but daughter is little and having a great day. We're just having a great day together. It's, as I recall, a Sunday, I was tired. They were playing and I said, I gotta get, I, I don't remember why, but I gave her a dollar and very quickly, she needed to go right then. Hey, dad, will you take me to the dollar store? No. Why? Because I preached twice today and we got something tonight. I'm not going to the dollar store. Dad, 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 dad. What? Take me to the dollar store. Take me to the dollar store. Take me to the dollar store. I said, no. She's sulky. She's crying. There's tears. And I said, you realize just a few moments ago when you had nothing. Like, did you say it with that much passion? Yes. When you had nothing. You were happy, you were singing, all was good. And then I gave you a dollar, a do one dollar. It's before it was the dollar 25 store, so don't mess with me, okay? Uh, I said, I gave you one dollar. And you became awful. I said, that's the meanest dollar I've ever seen. I said, that dollar, that's a bad dollar. I can't believe how bad that dollar, look what that dollar did to you. I said, bring me the dollar. She brought the dollar, they beat the way out of that dollar. So, um, you just got to, hey, you got to have this, you got to, we all have to have greed discipled out of us. Otherwise we fall in. He says, this is the danger in the last days. Is that the church fall into wealth for me, for my heart's protection. I'll tell you what I learned. And um, you, I think you, you'll be blessed by it. I was, I've been blessed by it my whole life. I learned to give back to God in about, about three or four ways. Um, and there's got to be a plan. There's got to be a plan to disciple your heart out of this stuff. Number one, I learned when I was little, like my parents started teaching me that you give the first tenth back to the Lord. That's called the tithe. And I take what God gave me and I give the tenth back to him. And that allows me to bless the Lord. It also acknowledges to God that which I have, I didn't get on my own. I didn't get that job. I didn't get that money. It ultimately belongs to you. The returning of the tithe is saying, thank you, God, for blessing me that I can bless you. Do, do I have to? Well, I don't, look, I'm not in charge of your finances. Does that make you feel better? It's not my job to tell you have to. Um, go, well, you know, early church, did they? No, early church didn't tithe. Early church gave all. We start with the tithe and work that direct. Am I right? Uh, hey, help you on this. Because some of you be like, you know, tithe is the law. Yeah, grace always exceeds the law. <laughs> And just remember that, write that on your notes somewhere. Grace always exceeds the law. In other words, the law says, don't murder. Grace says, love your enemies. All right? It always exceeds the law. The early church didn't tithe. They gave all. They laid it at the apostles' feet. That love of money has to be discipled out of it. Same kid that I spanked the dollar and got permission to tell all these stories. Driving with her, she has her paycheck. But we've been talking money about discipling the tithe. And so, Dad, I give a tenth, right? And I said, yes. I'm kind of proud of her. Yes. And she goes, of my bank account. What? I said, no, just, just for clarity, you give a tithe of whatever, whatever your check is, uh, whatever God gave to you. We drive just a moment. Like, nothing's too far in 29 Palms, so we drive just a little bit further. I go, um, so... Have you been tithing your whole bank account every month? She goes, yeah, every month. I've been giving 10% of whatever's in there back to God. 
let her put money in there. How do you think I felt? As a dad, I was like, whoa, you way outgave, just percentage-wise, you way outgave the entire family. Think I was proud of her? Because I'm thinking back to that day, I'm whooping the dollar. Said to her, we were leaving the bank, and I said, do you, do you feel bad that you gave all that money that you didn't necessarily have to, have to give? And she said, no, I feel great. I gave it to God. Isn't that great? Fine, because there were some disciples that said, hey, I not only give the first tenth to God, um, I think we're supposed to give above the tithe to benevolence. Benevolence is the ministry to the poor. In the church, we have a benevolence ministry. Here's the re- our deacons oversee a benevolence ministry. There are some needs that you've met as a church that you'll never know about because we don't get up here, holler about it, tell you, hey, we, we took care of this person's gas and we put this person up in a motel and we, we took care of this lady's, you know, we just, we don't tell you that. But I'll tell you as a church, you have blessed so many people by giving to benevolence and trusting the deacons of the church. Um, I also, for me, I know that I need to be ready for missions. I try to give with my tithe a little bit above the tithe every, every week to missions, but I also know this. I know once a year, my church, usually about February, is gonna take a special missions offering, and I'm just ready for them. Uh, I'm re- how do you know? Because I pastor the church, that's how I know. Uh, I know every February, March, somewhere in there, the church is gonna take a missions offering. Um, the giving that you give should reach far beyond the walls of this church. And that, include, that includes your tithes. Your tithes go far beyond this church. We take, every time you tithe, we're taking it and giving it uh, to all. And then once a year, we're going to go, hey, we're, we're going to take a missions offering that all of it goes straight beyond the walls of this, this church. That a pretty good outline. You know, um, I, I, I want to give to benevolence. I want to give to the tithe. I want to give to the missions. And then uh, can I just add this in there? Uh, for me, I have learned that I also just need to pay attention when I get slapped. Every now and then God just goes, bam, help her. What, what, what? You ever been slapped? None of you ever been slapped by God? Uh, you're talking to somebody. Usually the reason you don't know you're getting slapped is you're thinking somebody ought to, and God's like, well, you're right there. And you're like, well, shouldn't the church or the government or definitely the government or somebody, there are going to be times that God tells you, hey, help that lady. And you're supposed to help her. Well, sometimes when God gives me something, he's not giving it to me. He's just giving it through me. He didn't give it to me. There's just somebody coming that's going to need it. That's what James said. So did you think that everything you had, he said, you just bury it. It's just going to corrode. Sometimes, hey, let me help you with this. If you'll respond quickly when God slaps you to help somebody, he won't slap you so hard the next time. And pretty soon he'll just have to nudge you and you'll be like, yeah, I'm helping, I'm helping. Am I right? Every now and then God just says, hey, just help her. Help him. Go out there and and bless them. Illustrate that for you. Um, You're going, got your, your kid, they're little, and your friend's kid, you take them over to the park. Not around here. Uh, anyway, park with trees and stuff. Um, you get out and but say, hey, before you play, let's eat, your, let's eat our food. And they take out their little lunch bags, have little lunch bags, little paper bags. They open them up. And your kid takes out their sandwich and their kid takes out the sandwich. And take out, each of them take out their little juice boxes. And eat their sandwiches, eat their little juice boxes, eat their... Um, they're, they're little, what are those fish things? Goldfish, right? They eat the little goldfish. And then uh, at, at the end of it all, your child reaches in there and because you're a good parent, you have given them four cookies. And they reach in, they take it out and they've got four cookies. And the other little guy who is not blessed with such an awesome parent as you reaches in and, and there's nothing down at the bottom. What are you going to say to your child? You're gonna say, hey, why don't you share two of your cookies with him. And your child might say, but I, what, isn't that what you would say? Or are you more likely to look at the other child and go, oh, too bad. It's too bad you don't have a parent like me. See, we were driving in. I saw some berries in the trees over there. Maybe you could go pick some berries. Would you say that to that kid? No, you would look at your child and you'd say, hey, I want you to share. And what if your child said, but it's not fair. It's not fair. I, I, those are my cookies. And you would say, yeah, but you have four and he has none. I mean, it's not only going to corrode in the last days, it's going to make you fat, kid. Share. (laughs) Why? Because you have more than you need. And I just want you to, isn't that that us? But what, what if, what if 
you're sitting there and your kid pulls out the four and the other kid has nothing and your kid just um, un, unprovoked. You didn't have to slap him. No, there's no, sorry. Put the next service on YouTube. You, you look at your kid and they just on their own. Go, hey, you don't have any cookie. I'll give you two of my cookies. What would you do? When you got alone with your kid, you'd say, you know, when your friend had no cookies and you shared with him all on your own, I was so proud of you. James says, that's the way we want it to go down on judgment day. That's the way we want it to go down, that we've got a father that was awesomely proud of us, that we didn't hoard wealth or make the harvesters cry out, that we didn't cheat people and defraud people, but that we outdid the wicked in our generosity and that we showed extravagant love. Um, just one last one, just one more, one more blessing in there. Look, there's the blessing of today, the blessing of perspective, the blessing of gold, but there's one more, and that's the blessing of forecast. And you've got to aim for it. There's a warning that he gives that there will be a day of judgment. Look, before you leave on a trip, you check the forecast. James is just setting you up for success here. He says, look, um, you're just a vapor. And very soon, very soon, sooner than you think, you're gonna just stand before God. Do not let the things of this world corrode your soul. Um, a passage like this, does it leave you feeling a little bit leveled? Because I think it should. I think, I think it's supposed to. Because James is saying to everybody, wicked and righteous, look, understand, one day very soon, you're gonna have a conversation with God. And life really was not at all about you. You came out of the womb thinking it was all about you, but it was not all about you. Your grandma said it was all about you, but it was not all about you. Look, the earth existed long before me. Um, and there's someone above it all. And he didn't just make Haley's Comet, he made Haley. Um, he created the earth, the moon, Mars. He knows that Pluto's a planet. We're confused, he knows. He, he formed you know, trees and animals and rivers. And he created you and he created me and he planned our lives. He not only directs the streams of the earth and the planets in their course, he directs our life. Um, he planned your life and he gave you everything you have. Everything you, and look, one day you're gonna talk to God about what you did with what you had. Hey, what, what did you do with your talents? All of the talents that, that I gave you did you use your spiritual gifts to build the kingdom of God or just to get gold? Did you use your leadership for God's kingdom? Did you use the teaching gifts that I gave you to, to teach children? Did you, did you use the gift of compassion? Um, what, what if God asks you, did you assume everything I gave you was for you? Or did you ever consider that I might just be giving it through you? And those times that I told you to, to help somebody, just, just unspurred, out of the blue. How, how did you treat the poor? I, I was good to the poor. You were, yeah. When I drove by homeless people, I rolled down my window and I yelled, get a job! And probably blessed them. Did you give them anything? No. How, um, how did you handle the gold that I gave you, the wealth? I kept it. All, all, all of it? Yes. What'd you do? I bought a boat. You live in 29 Palms. You know? Spent my time, uh, this, is, this is moderns, can't wait. I, I live, I hold on to all this stuff so that someday I can retire and golf. Maybe you should think about the kingdom of God. Pastor, I'm thinking about the kingdom of God. I'm gonna get golf balls and the golf balls are gonna say John 3:16. There's gonna be little 316s all over the golf course. Like James would go, you, you missed it. But hey, hear me. The most impression of life is gonna be this. What'd you do with Jesus? What did you do with Jesus? Because every now and then somebody will say something to me. They don't say it as much anymore. But like, well, you know, all, all paths lead to God. And hey, hear me, all paths do lead to God to the seat of the judgment where we all answer to God. But there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And what, listen, you talk about unseen blessings. One of the unseen blessings of life is the clarity of the gospel. 
And one of the things that is most frustrating in, a, in, in the world we're in is how the church cannot clearly articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is this. Can I just tell, I'm going to tell you, so just say yeah. The gospel is that we are sinners and on our own we are headed to hell. But you've got a God who radically loves you. And he didn't just say, I don't want you to go to hell. He said, I will go, I will die on a cross and I will you and I'll pay your price. And he died on that cross and took your sins on himself and paid for your sins. But the great news is he didn't stay dead, he rose again. And what he offers us is life. Not that we just collect and hoard the stuff of this earth, but he gives you something much better, which is eternal life. You guys have so much to offer. So much to offer. Don't waste it on a world. Live generous lives. Live lives that honor the gospel of Jesus. Come on up, praise team, and I'll close with this. Uh, at, a, at a funeral, we're, you know, one of my family funerals. So family is gathered, and I'm talking to a family member I've not talked to in a long time. I said, how are we doing the how are yous and all that? We all grew up kind of the same church culture. I said, you in church? And he kind of hung his head because, I mean, we're here and I'm the pastor here. So he kind of hangs his head. He goes, no, no. He goes, but you know, I, I know I got to get back into church for the kids. I said, no, you don't. And he looked up like, really? I can skip. I said, uh, no, you don't need to get back in for the kids. It, you need to get back in because you have something to offer the kingdom of God. And you have counted yourself out. And thank God you're going to take your kids. And thank God, but before you just take your kids and drop them off, don't for a moment think that you're not wasting time, that you've got something to give to the Lord. And I'd say that to my church family too. The church isn't just for the kids or for somebody else. The great mistake we make is assuming that we don't have anything to offer God when God has given us so much. Um, I want to do this at the end of a hard passage. Can I just give you time between you and the Lord? And some of you, you've got business to do at this altar where you need to say, God, I've been living life for me and I need to live for you. Some of you may need to make a decision to follow him for eternal life. Not to get rich, not to, not to, but to be eternally blessed by him. Some of you are just weighed down by the weight of life. Because life is heavy, isn't it? You got teenagers, you should be praying up here. Got toddlers. One of the things I love is sometimes people just say to each other in this church, hey, meet me at the altar. We're going to pray together. People will tell me before service starts, hey, I'll meet you at the altar. I can't. And one of the things that's important to me as a church family is that we have time together at an altar. Because really, it's not about a sermon. It's not about music. It's about you responding to the gospel of Jesus. And so I would just invite you here, lay down your burdens to make decisions for Jesus. We're here. I would love to pray with you. You can skip us and just come straight to this altar. You can pray from your seat. But let me just give you time between you and Jesus. Would you stand? You come. Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmsbaptistchurch.com.